scriptures teach that it's my job to prepare you. I'm preparing you for the eclipse tomorrow. Okay? So as you stare at me today and your eyes begin to burn, you say, oh, I can't do that tomorrow. I can't stare at that eclipse tomorrow. So it's my job to prepare you today. That does not mean you can go to sleep, all right? Some of y'all going, what's this? I won't stare at it. <laughs> Boy, I'm glad you're here this morning. I'm glad I'm here this morning. Because you know what? Every day that I get to get up, that's another day that God's given me here. That's another day that I get opportunity to give him praise and glory for what he's done. But not only that, I get to give him praise and glory for what he's going to do. You know, it's my God that's going to make that eclipse tomorrow. You do know that, don't you? Ain't got nothing to do with science. It ain't got nothing to do with anything else. God's going to swipe that by there tomorrow. That's what he does. Those things that amaze us. So tomorrow, if you're going to look at it, make sure you're prepared, okay? I done been told I couldn't go outside because I'll do something stupid. <laughs> so you have to prepare yourself. So tonight and today, just ask God just to protect you. Well, we're glad you're here. Thank you for this past week. Man, I tell you what, the word that was brought this past week, I needed every word that was preached. Yes. I needed in my life every word that God sent. And uh, he's going to use that to exalt and glorify his name in his church. So thank you all for, for that last week. Let's go to Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we love you. Father, we thank you so much for being just a great and awesome God. Lord, we thank you not only, Father, for what you've done this past week in revival, Father. But Lord, I pray, God, in the days to come as we, as we move forward, Father. Lord, I pray you take those revival words, Father, and you, keep, you just keep impressing them in our hearts, Lord. Until our lives just conform and transform into what you want us to be, Father, to glorify your name. Lord, this morning as we come, Lord, we lift every name up that's been mentioned in Sunday school. Lord, every name that is on our prayer list, Father. I pray, God, you work in those lives, Lord, but I just pray your will be done. Lord, this morning as we come, Father, into your house, Lord, I ask for the Holy Spirit just to come in with us, Lord, and just be real. Be fresh to us today. Anoint us straight from the throne this morning. Father, we love you, and we thank you, Lord. It's time to pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Singing now the great gospel this morning, let's turn to 171. <coughs>
something happen in your life that made you reflect on something of the past? Y'all ever? Last night, let me tell you what happened. I was going to do brotherhood down at Concord, down in Alabama. Joe was going to go with me, and J.D. was going to go. Joe said, I'll come by and pick you up. Okay. He goes by and picks J.D. up first. And then him, me, and Joe, and J.D. pile in Joe's old truck. All three of them. I forgot them trucks was that little. <laughs> so here we are, and J.D. is in the middle. And here's what's so funny. We had to make a stop on the way. We handed J.D. all the Bible. So J.D.'s sitting in the middle, holding all the Bible, <laughs> like this. I said, you know, I remember back when I was a teenager, back when I was a kid, we used to pile four or five up in the cab of the truck and ride around. I said, how in the world did we do that? <laughs> but then we got down there and had a great time at the brotherhood. But then I seen this look of fear on J.D.'s face. <laughs> Let me tell you why. They fed us pinto beans. <laughs> at the brotherhood. And J.D. is sitting here knowing that he's going to have to get back in the middle of that truck. <laughs> <coughs> and I thought about that just now, and I'm thinking, J.D.'s thinking, I've come too far to turn back now. <laughs> Isn't it great that we can laugh in God's house? Isn't it great? And God's okay with it, church, I'm telling you. God's okay with it as long as it's in good taste. And he gets the glory. And can I tell you what? He got the glory because we got home safe and was able to get up this morning. Amen. But you know what I'm telling you? I want you to look with me this morning while you're turning your Bibles over to the fourth chapter of Ephesians. I want you to see something with me this morning. As I sat down all week this week and I've been looking in this passage, and if you ever run across something and, and I try to make it, and I'm sorry, Andy, all my batteries are dead. So I'll try not to move very far this morning. But I sat down, and all this week I've sat down and tried to make outline on this. And, and the Lord would show me something and you try to write it down. And sometimes the Lord just don't let you do that. Sometimes he just says, I just want you to preach this passage. I want you to share this passage. And what I want you to do is I want you to trust the Holy Spirit. You've studied it this week. You've been in it this week. You know what I want brought out of it this week. Leave yourself out of it and let me do it. Okay? Of course, being myself, I still try to pin the things down that I wanted to bring in. But as I thought about this passage and I thought about you, and I want you to understand something. Many, many times in the church today, especially when folks get older, sometimes when they're young, they get this thought in mind. I have nothing to contribute to God's church. I have nothing to contribute. I want you to understand something here this morning. Any born again child of God, any believer in Christ, God has given you a spiritual gift of some sort. Amen. He has given you something that you can use to contribute into God's house. Not everybody's a singer. Let me tell you something. This is what happens before we get into this passage. What happens in this passage, and too many times, folks get gifts confused with natural abilities and talents. They're not the same thing, okay? Some people have a natural talent. Some people are given a natural talent when they are born, and God allows them to have that, and that talent is great. I know many, many great singers in this world that have been given a natural talent to sing but do not have a spiritual gift because they're outside of the body of Christ. They can sing, but they don't have a gift. That gift is not given you at the birth in the flesh. That gift is given you when you're birthed into the body of Christ through the acceptance of Jesus Christ. Everybody has something to contribute. So never sit in a pew and say, I can contribute nothing. I don't have anything. If you're a born-again child of God, you've got something to give. Amen. And it takes all of that to make the body work. It takes all of that to make everything do what it's supposed to. In this passage this morning, let's read this together, fourth chapter of Ephesians, <laughs> beginning at verse 7. And let's look at this together this morning. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when, when he ascended upon high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he 
now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended into first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers and the, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait and deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may we grow up into him in all things, which is the head of even Christ, for whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working of the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Look at that passage. What a great, great passage that is because what Paul does right here for the church, he lays it out. He said, here it is, guys. This, to me, this is one of the most important passages in this book right here because he lays it out. And we understand that he starts up here and he says, but everyone is given gra giving grace according to the fullness of the gift of Christ. That grace that's given everybody, can I tell you something? The grace and that full gift of Christ is equal to everybody. Everybody is under that gift. Everybody receives that gift. We live under the grace of Christ because he gave it to us. And he gave it to everybody equal. That's the same grace we're all saved under. But when you get to them down past that and you start looking at what Christ did and you see that part in that passage that talks about he's the same one that descended out of heaven, descended into the lower parts of the earth, the one that led captivity captive. I get this beautiful picture when I think about that of a marching throne, Christ in the lead, the army behind him, the captivity of death behind him in chains. And what he did, this same Christ that came to die on the cross of Calvary. Now you can look at that depths of the earth in a couple different ways. If you really look at that thing and study that thing out, and many people do. Some people look at this earth right here as the place he came to lead captivity captive. And you touch, study the scriptures and it says that he's laid in the, in, in, the, in the earth for three days. And when he laid in the earth for three days, he went to deliver the ones that had come before. See, nobody could enter into where the Father was till Jesus got there. Till Jesus got to where God was, nobody could enter that place. There was a place set up for them. There was a place for them. And they had to wait on the Messiah to come. And what Jesus did at the cross of Calvary, after he fulfilled what the Father to do, he went and got them. And when he ascended, bless God, he carried them with him. That's good. That's the same Jesus that delivered us from death, that delivered the captivity of death, the same Jesus that gives gift. Don't you love to receive a gift? There's nobody in this room that's sitting here that can say, I don't love to receive something. Y'all like him, women, y'all like him surprise gifts your husband gives. Don't you? Boy, I'm going to put y'all on the spot, baby. Mm -hmm. Y'all surprise gifts that your husband just out of the blue might to give you a little something just because he loves you. When's the last time y'all done that, men? I'm not going to look too far in the corner over here, okay? <laughs> but you see those gifts. But, but, but we love that. And even though, men, you love that too, you love to receive a gift. Just a thoughtful gift from somebody. And, and at Christmas, you love to receive. I know we love to give, and I love to give too. But also too, you love to receive something. It makes you feel special when you receive something from somebody. You see, the gifts that Christ gave, he gave to everybody. And he gave it individually. And he poured it out individually. And it's not something that's just a spontaneous gift that he pops up and says, listen, I'm going to give this whole one gift to Stedman Baptist Church and I'm going to pour it out to Stedman Baptist Church. That's the grace we're saved under. We've all got that, that gift that he's given. And if I started counting around this room this morning, every one of you have a separate gift that you can contribute into this church. For the edifying of the body of Christ. To build the body of Christ. And you know what happens when all the gifts are not being put in like they're supposed to? Then everything's not firing like it's supposed to. When you look at an engine in a car. If every part of that engine is not doing what it's supposed to. Listen, listen to this. It may be running. 
but it's not running like it's supposed to. It may be functioning, but it's not functioning like it's supposed to. Why? Because all the parts are not doing what they're supposed to. Everything's not doing what it's supposed to. See, because what Paul does is he takes this great, great unity that we've learned in the first part of this, and all of a sudden we go from unity to diversity that brings unity. Isn't, it, isn't that crazy? Isn't that a crazy thought? You're unified, but you're diversified to be unified. In other words, everybody's not the same. Everybody's different. You know, I begin to think about that. I begin to think about the talents. And we know what, the, what Jesus taught on the talents. When the talents were given out, one used his talents. Now, we know the talents in that, in that passage talking about money. We understand that. But the one used his talents. And what did God say? Oh, I'm pleased with that. What did the husbandman say when he came back? Well, I'm pleased with what you did with that. You invested those talents in, and you grew those talents, and it multiplied. The other one did the same. But one buried his talents. Then why'd you bury it? Why didn't you use it? Why didn't you use what I gave you? Why didn't you take what I gave you to advance? Why didn't you do that? You didn't. You buried it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it back. Listen, when God gives us talents and he gives us natural abilities, he expects us to use them. But what he does, this is the great part of that, church. Listen, and he expects us to use those talents, but when he takes that spiritual gift and he pours that out on that talent and you become so desired in that gift to use that talent for the glorification of a holy God, then God's all in it and he's going to bless everything about it. I'm, I'm going to show you something this morning. I thought about this illustration all week. He may be mad at me when I get done and he just had to get over it. I thought about Jim. Listen. June is a talented man. He has a talent to sing. He has a talent for music. God instilled that in him when he was born. But see, when June was born into the kingdom of God, God poured a spiritual gift out on June that everybody don't have. He can take a little ragtag bunch of folks that can't sing, and he can make them sound good. Because God gave him the gift to lead those people. Now, when we come together as a choir and when we come up here to sing, every voice individually is not meant to sing by itself. But when you take those voices and somebody that can lead those voices through the spirit of a holy God and those voices come together, a choir is formed and that leader of that choir leads it and the choir sings and it's beautiful music. Amen. It's beautiful music. See, that's what God does with a talent and a gift. But everybody don't have that. But you have a desire to sit up here and sing. You want to sit up here and sing, and you know you can't sing by yourself, but when you sit by the ones beside you, then you can sing. See how great that is? See, that's what God does. That's what God does. And he brings those natural abilities, and he brings those talents, and he puts them out there. But if everybody's not contributing like they should, things are not running like they should. We've got a brand new church here coming up. Did y'all know that? Starting in September. Are you ready? Listen. Are you ready to give all into this new church here? We should be giving all anyway. Sunday school teachers, are you ready to pour your heart into teaching your Sunday school class this next year? Are you ready to use what God asks? And can I go on and tell you that? On that same note, everybody's not a teacher. Everybody's not a teacher. It'd be nice if you, everybody was, but everybody's not. But you look on in this passage, and we get ready to pour this thing out. And he says this. He said he gives some. He gives some apostles. He gives some prophets. He gives evangelists. He gives pastors and teachers. Now, these, these listings come in a couple different places in the New Testament. They come in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. They come in Romans chapter 12, and they're a little bit different than every one of them. But when you look in this passage right here, he says he gave some apostles. I want you to understand something, church. There are no more apostles. By the de definition of apostle, there are no more apostles walking this earth. The apostles are the ones that were called directly by the Lord himself, the one that saw the Lord himself in the resurrection and spent time with him. 
And you say, then how in the world can Paul be brought to an apostle? Because the apostle Paul was one-on-one -on -one with Jesus Christ. When Jesus appeared to him, it was such a great feat that he couldn't even look at it. He could not even look at it. But they don't exist anymore. They're not here anymore. They had their time. They had their place. And God used them. And they're gone now. And you look at prophets. Now, can I tell you something? Some of y'all are going to look at me real funny when I say this. Some people would deem themselves prophets now. There are no more prophecies. The prophecies have already been fulfilled in the Scripture. They're already here. They're already done. They're already laid out. All, all we're doing is waiting for those prophecies to finish up. And that's the coming of Christ. We're waiting on that. There are no more prophecies, but the Bible does teach on prophesying in the New Testament. And when you see a prophesying in the New Testament, that means that you're teaching to the edification of the body of Christ. You're teaching what prophecies have already been laid down. You're teaching what God has already put in his word. And you're teaching that to build up the body of Christ. That's what that means when you see prophesying in the New Testament. That prophet that he's talking about right there, the Old Testament prophets, they're not here anymore. The New Testament prophets ain't nothing but teachers of the gospel. They're teacher, teachers of what's already here. So you be careful then. And you say, why would you say that, preacher? Because you need to know these things for the edifying of the body. Because too many people get caught up in these things because I still see things on TV where people deem themselves apostles. Now I'm going to tell you, I've had one-on-one -on -one experience with Christ. That's my salvation. I have one-on-one -on -one experiences with him all the time. I hope you do too. But it's not to give me any prophecy. It's to help me and lead me. I heard Alton the other night. I'll this at you. I've never told you this before. I heard Alton the other night. He said that after the Lord called him to preach, he ran for a year. He said the most miserable year of his life. Probably 20 years. That's about how long I ran for what I knew God wanted me to do. About 20 years. Bless him. Because I said, no, no, Lord, I, I can't do that. I don't have the ability to do that. I don't have the talent to do that. I don't have this to do that. And you know what he kept telling me? I mean, and listen to this, church, and I'm just going to be point blank honest with you tonight. Even when you could be in a drunken stupor, the Holy God will come down to you and say, when are you going to do what I'm telling you to do? When are you going to do what I'm telling you that you're supposed to? When are you going to give in to this? This is before we, Laura and I are even married. No, not me. Not, no. And then you come to a place, listen to this, and you think, you think, well, I've got it all figured out now. I, 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 I've come, and the Lord sent me, sent me a great wife. He sent me that, and, and I'm back in church, and I'm doing what I'm supposed to. I wasn't even in church. And he comes, and, he's, and I'm back in church now, and, and Lord, you know, I'm teaching Sunday school class. I, I'm a deacon. I, I, I'm good, Father. I don't, I don't need He said, that's all fine and good. You're still not doing what I've called you to do. You're still not fulfilling and using the spiritual gift that I have set apart for you. You're not doing it. And there was no peace. You tried to create peace. You ever tried to create peace? By saying, well, I'm good. I'm good, Father. I'm good. I've got peace in my heart with what I'm doing. I'm good. And all the whole time you just got this sense you know. And you're one of the most miserable human beings on the inside. Until you say, I can't do this anymore. I can't live like this anymore. And you say, God, quit kicking me. I'll do it. And when you do that, now listen to this. There's some of you running from your gifts this morning. It might not be the pastor of church. But you're running from what God has for you to do. You'll never know a peace until you say, okay, God, pour it on me. And he does. 
And you're not going to come out of the gate knowing everything. You've got to go through the troubles and the trials and the learning processes and all that stuff while God is edifying you and building you in the body. When you look at this passage, he says he gives some evangelists. I love evangelists that can travel from place to place and share the gospel and preach the gospel. And they have this natural born gift to go in a place and share the gospel in a way that can lead people to Christ that sometimes we, the pastors don't have. But every now and then what the Lord does is he'll take a pastor and he'll give him opportunity to be an evangelist for a little while. He'll give him opportunity to go somewhere else and preach. The Lord's given me that opportunity this year. And everybody go, pastors go through those cycles. I've, been, I've had the ability, I've had the opportunity to preach a revival back in the first of the summer. I get the opportunity to preach another revival this coming week. I got another revival coming up in September. I got to go preach one night for Mason Bush in October. God gives you those opportunities. And there's two ways you can look at that. You can look at that and say, Oh, Lord, here we go again. Or you can look at that and say, what an opportunity God has given me. Lord, prepare me, equip me, get me ready for what you have in those revivals. And as you come in this church, what you've got to do is say, God, that gift that you've given me, I haven't poured it in like I should. I haven't given it like I should. I have not bought into everything that you've laid out there for me, God. Lord, that gift you've given me, I want to contribute into the edifying of the body of Christ. He goes on and he says, I, I even make pastors and teachers. And if you'll notice in that passage right there, that's one in the same in this passage. He didn't say I gave some pastors and some teachers. In this passage, in this particular passage right here, that's one in the same. Pastor being a shepherd to lead the flock. And do what? Teach the flock. Can I tell you what? Scariest thing in the world is being a pastor. Because you look at the responsibilities that go with it. And it's terrifying. Because you know you're not always going to be liked. You know you're going to be loved. But you're not always going to be liked. And that's okay. <coughs> as long as you're preaching the truth. And sharing the truth. And standing on the truth and standing right here. Did you know everything has to be done in the church? Everything that's done in church has to be scriptural. It has to be of God's word. If it's not of God's word, then it's made up of man. And if it's made up of man, it falls under that next section. It falls under false doctrine. And it falls under false teaching. And that says that I can go in and I can make my own things up. And I can lead people in my own fault in my own process, in the thing that I want done. And I've seen that happen today. And I've seen things fold in that fact today. But if you'll stand on what God's Word says, then He's going he's to be in it. He's going to advance it. He's going to multiply it. He's going to grow it. But He's got to do it. Man can. But He pours it out on us and He says this. He says, if you'll get in the body and you'll learn and you'll pour the gifts in, then... Listen to this. Till we come to the unity of the day. While we're being perfected here. While we're being brought here. There's a day coming. Don't you do this church. There's a day coming when you're going to be perfect. There's a day coming when you're going to be where Christ is. There's a day coming when everything that you've learned here. Everything that you've been taught here. Everything that's been poured out on you. is going to be fulfilled. And you're going to be in the presence of Christ. And you don't have to do those things anymore. He has brought you to that place of full spiritual maturity. He's brought you to that place. But this whole process here, this whole thing right here is getting you ready for that day. Are we ready if the Lord called us home today in our spirituality? Are we ready for full? Listen to this. Are we ready for full-time worship? Are we ready for full-time praise? Are we ready for those things? Have we spent enough time being perfected? Have we edified? Have we pushed? There's nothing I love seeing more than the children of Christ and the body of Christ draw closer to Him in many different areas. This revival we've had this past week has drawn some people closer to Christ. Not only have they told me that, you can see it. And it's drawn them and it's pulled them closer. 
Because God had the word for them. That's why he sent who he sent. And he goes on and he says, listen. And he wants you, he wants you bought in. Why? Because he don't want you to give in to the false doctrines. Can I tell you what? There's a world out there. And this goes back to some words Jesus said. I'm sending you out amongst the wolves. This, that's words of Jesus. I'm sending you out amongst wolves. Are you prepared to go amongst the wolves? Are you strong enough in the doctrines of Christ? Are you strong enough in the word of God to do battle with a bunch of wolves? Because I'm telling you, they're there. They're there and they want you. There's another word that he uses in that, in that passage that you need to understand too. Ravenous. That means they'll eat you alive. If you're not rooted and grounded in God's word. If you're not buying in with your spiritual gifts. Because you know what he does? When you use your spiritual gifts and you buy in with your spiritual gifts, he's using that to equip you. He's using that to prepare you. As he teaches right here, he's using that to perfect the body of Christ. I think sometimes we come to a place and we think, I'm about perfect as I'm going to get. I'm about perfect as I'm going to get. I'm not going to get any more perfect than I am right now. Physically, you're probably right. Spiritually, you ain't even close. We're not even close. I'm not close. You're not close. See, but we got to come to that place and say, God, I want to be better. I want to be better in your eyes. I want to be better for you. That's what Paul's telling the church here. I'm telling you this, guys, because I want you to be better. I want to move you in a direction. I want to, I want to prepare you for the deceivers. I want to prepare you for the craftiness out, craftiness that's out there. Can I ask you something? Are your children prepared for the craftiness that's out there? Are they? I'm not about your children at home. Are they prepared for what the world has to offer? Are they prepared? I don't know if anybody is prepared. I don't know if anybody is either, James. But the time we live in now is worse than it's ever been. It's worse than it's ever been. And you know what I'm seeing happen? Listen to this. I'm seeing this body of Christ, this unified body of Christ. You know what I'm happening? You know what I'm seeing happen? I'm seeing the things of the world creep into that unified body. And what's happening? You see it start to be torn apart. You see the ravenous wolves come in and begin to tear that unified body apart. Why? Because we're weak in the word. Why? Because we're weak in our gifts. We're not using them like we should. We're not buying in. We're not trusting. We're not saying, okay, God, here I am. Use me in any way you want me to. And what happens is they begin to tear apart. Have you ever seen a dog or, or, or a wolf or anything or an animal tear another piece of flesh up? Have you ever witnessed that? I, I've seen it done. I mean, I've seen it happen. It's one of the most gruesome things you'll ever see. And you know what happens when you see those wolves attack God's church and attack God's people and begin to pull it apart? It's one of the most gruesome things you've ever seen because you start to see the natural side of people come out. And I'm going to tell you something. The natural side of people can be hurt. That's why Paul says we've got to learn to speak the truth in love. Or we could put it this way. Truth without love is brutality. Love without truth is hypocrisy. So we got to say, okay, God, how do we do that? I want to be able to, uh, now listen to this. Don't go up to somebody and say, that's those who out of everything. <laughs> and I'll tell you that because I love you. <laughs> There's another word for that called stupidity, okay? <laughs> There's something, but, but, but people get in their mind, I can do that because that's what God's word teaches. That's not what God's talking about right there. What God's talking about right there is I'm going to love my people that are here, and I'm going to love them so much that I'm going to tell them the truth. Why? Because I want them protected. They may not enjoy it, 
when I tell it, but I'm telling it with love so that they can advance and they can get better. Because I love them. But see, if I love you, and I do love you, but if I didn't tell you the truth, you know what that love's called? In vain. It's just called empty. Because without the truth of God's word, we're nothing. And the Bible says, right here, you have to learn that and you have to know that so that this can be done, so that this can be evolved. Because this whole body, this whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. It's compacted with the truth. And it's compacted with the love. And it's compacted with the spiritual gifts. And it's compacted with the natural talents. It's compacted with everything that God pours in it. And when God compacts that together, he makes something beautiful that works in harmony, that works in a great love for each other, that moves in the direction he wants it to go, that's obedient to what he wants it to do. That's what God does. And he just lays it out. The problem is we don't want to listen. We don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear those things. What does that mean? I want it working in this manner so that, look at this, according to the effectual working of the measure of every part, make an increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. If everything's working together, if everything is doing what it's supposed to, the body of Christ is being built. Built up. Brought up. Moved up. Grown up. In love. The grace is given for the full measure of the gift. So if you sit there today, have you been contributing into the body what God's given you to contribute? This is not a monetary thing. This is a point blank spiritual thing. Can I tell let me tell you, can I tell you what happens when when God gets in something and how he can multiply something when it's of him? And I won't, I won't get this number exactly right, but I'm going to get it fairly close. Since God's got in in allowing us to proceed in this building fund, do you know what he's done in a four-week period? In a four-week period, he has almost completely, he has, he's over doubled, he's almost tripled what we had in the building in four weeks. Y'all believe that? In four weeks, he almost tripled what we've had in the building. That's a God thing. Yeah. But do you know what he's going to do with the body when we get obedient? When we give in, we use our gifts, we use what God's given us, and we pour in what God has. You know what he's going to do? He's going to have increase. Our thought process right there is saying, well, he's going to grow this church. He's going to grow us spiritually. God is going to bring us spiritually to where he wants us to be before he moves us physically, okay? That's what he does. And I'm praying for you, and I'm praying for me, to grow spiritually, to grow in his sight, to give in. Have you given those gifts? Have you even thought about the gift that God's given you? Not everybody's a singer. Not everybody's a teacher. But you have something to you outside of that. Not everybody's a leader, but you have something to contribute outside of that. It may be something as simple as picking up a phone call and calling somebody. You have a gift to give. So if we'll come to a place that we just go all in, then everything becomes compact. 
Then everything becomes jointed together, fit together. Then we stop running for 20 years. We stop running for 20 years and saying, God, use me. That's some of y'all in here that would say, I, 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 get that. We got a truck driver that comes in the farm over there and he gets excited and he can't talk. Just a stutter. A lot of times when we know we're not doing what God wants us to do, you know what we do? We get stuck. We can't even get word out. Fitly joined. When something is fitly joined, I know a wolf has a hard time. He has a hard time. something is fitly joined, the craftiness and the cunningness of the world has a hard time getting in between. When something is fitly joined, false doctrines, false teachings, has a hard time getting in between. But if we're, listen to this, if we're not contributing what God's given us, You leave a crack in your house, what happens? Cold air blows in in the wintertime, hot air in the summertime. You get uninvited guests that you really don't want. I mean, that's just true. You know what happens when we leave cracks in the body? Sometimes we get uninvited guests that we really don't want. So this morning, church, ask yourself, Am I contributing what God wants me to give? Am I giving what God has given me? Am I giving it back to Him? A am I in here for the perfecting of the saints, for the edifying, for the building up of the body? Why am I here today? You may ask yourself, what is my gift today? What is my spiritual gift? I've never figured out what my spiritual gift was. God show it to you. But when He shows it to you, He expects you to use it. He expects you to apply it to what you have. So just want to ask yourself, am, am, I, am I fitly joined? Am I where I'm supposed to be? I know this is not one of them amen sermons. It's not one of them that we like to hear all the time. <coughs> but see, that's the thing about speaking the truth in love. It's one of them that you got to hear. So this morning, Ask yourself, am I where I'm supposed to be in the Lord? As they come with a song. Number 240. And as you say, I, I went all in. You heard some great preaching last week. Well, you heard some messages last week that bring you to a place. And as you stand with us this morning, and as you ask God, you ask yourself, am I where I'm supposed to be? Am I, am I contributing where I should? Have I put it all in? Ask yourself. And say, God, work in me as they sing this morning. Oh, to Jesus, I surrender. Oh, to Jesus, I surrender.